Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Kate Orff. I'm the director of the Columbia Urban Design Program in uh, New York City. And uh, we have the distinct pleasure uh, today to welcome uh, the office of P.K. Das, in particular, uh, P.K. Das himself and Samarth Das. Uh, I would like to say proudly that uh, Samarth is a graduate of the MSAUD program and a much beloved uh, alum. And uh, to this lecture series, this is uh, the a global lecture series titled Urban Design in Practice with the idea of highlighting in a global context, the incredible diversity and uh, of the ways that urban design is being practiced in different contexts and with different methods, means, and visions. Um, I could not think of a, a better uh, practice to, to spotlight uh, in, this, uh, in this series than the work of the Office of P.K. Das. Um, P.K. himself is, is quite an inspiration to, to all of us in urban design. Uh, I believe uh, the work, his work and the work of the office in the way that it spans buildings, interiors, uh, urban design, and community movements is something truly to uh, look to as a model of forms of practice. Uh, he is a, uh, a figure, a towering figure in, in this uh, space of, of community engaged design and community driven design. Uh, and really uh, his, the work uh, has really provided so many models for all of us. Their practice is largely based in India and in Mumbai, uh, headquartered in Mumbai, but the, the methods, methodology of the work uh, has a sort of ricocheted effect uh, in, in many contexts. Uh, so uh, we could, couldn't be happier to meet uh, and both of you this morning. And I just wanted to say a quick thank you and acknowledgement to David Smiley and Tal, Tal Furst from um, Columbia uh, for their assistance with this lecture series. And the uh, process is that um, I will see the stage to PK and Samarth, and then uh, David Smiley will help uh, moderate uh, Q and A. So uh, during the uh, during the at the end of the the lecture, so you can prepare your questions and uh, have them ready to go for David to moderate. Um, welcome again to everyone, every student around the world, every faculty member, wherever you are, and uh, we're glad to be able to have this global lecture series where we can share ideas and look at alternative models. Um, so with that, I will uh, say uh, welcome and uh, take it away, Samarth and PK. Welcome again, we're so pleased to have you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, it's indeed an honor and a privilege to have been invited by you. Kate, thank you so much. Um, I am extremely humbled to, um, by your presence. Uh, Kate, I very honestly respect your work and consider it uh, to be significant. You've done some significant work that's an inspiration to all of us. Um, and thank you so much once again to invite Samarth and I uh, to make this presentation. Um, well, I don't know if this is going to be a kind of a model example of the work that we do, but, but we are struggling. We, we, every day we are struggling. And I suppose there's no end to that. And there's no end to achieving what we all desire to achieve. And that struggle must continue. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, David. Thank you, Tal. I see many others um, participating. Um, thank you all of you to having made time to come here. Um, I, if I have to just sort of summarize in three points uh, the, the content of my talk today, um, I'm, I just put it this way. The first point that I, can, I will dwell upon is sustainable ecology achievement. The second is really demonstrating change through participatory planning and design endeavors. And the third is the the title uh, that you see on the slide here, which is re-envisioning cities and their democratization. So I think these are the three key uh, points on which 
I will dwell upon uh, through my talk. Uh, coming to the first point, Samartha and I are very deeply concerned about the state of relationship between people and us collectively with nature. For us, ecology includes people and nature. The two are inextricably entwined and neither are exclusive. Recognition of this relationship is critical for our understanding of the current state of ecology and its future. Any attempt that we're making to separate one from the other, which has always been the kind of tradition, uh, historically speaking, is to undermine our struggle for the achievement of sustainable ecology. Sadly, this relationship has been severed. Uh, governments and development agencies over the years have continued to attack nature and systematically destroy the natural habitats and the natural conditions that sustain our lives. Tragically, the municipal corporation in Mumbai has gone ahead and built these impervious concrete walls all along the edges of the water bodies, water, uh, water courses and the rivers, thereby severing the symbiotic relationship between land and water. Such concretization of rivers and water courses is sadly being hotly pursued by governments across Indian states, including by hordes of mindless architects and planners. The rampant destruction of the natural conditions has led to frequent experiences of climate catastrophe, as I call it, that is threatening our health, indeed our very survival. We just learned now, yesterday and today from the news, and not surprisingly, that the temperatures in USA and Canada have reached a record high of 40 degrees. Uh, I just listened to the television and was informed that you know the temperature in Canada has gone up to 49.5 degrees in the north of Canada. Now, this is this worries us, and we have to uh, be extremely careful in dealing with these issues in all our work and engagements. While we have, and governments and development agencies have continuously neglected our natural habitats and natural conditions and the environment, governments have been no different in their response to people. Polarization of people on the basis of class, caste, religion, faith, gender, continues to be reinforced each day. Today, as, as people, we stand sharply divided. Also, more and more people are being denied access to resources and their rights. As a matter of fact, a state of alienation and violence defines our way of life. What we are deeply concerned about, therefore, is the constant division of our cities into disparate fragments, both in social and special terms. Therefore, struggles for their unification has come to become an important objective. It is with this objective that we consider building relationships between people and collectively with nature as an important mission. This is the essence of our talk, focused on an understanding of these relationships and the networks of interactions, particularly those that develop in the process of collective interventions by citizens on demands pertaining to social and environmental justice and how they could contribute to the larger interest of sustainability of cities, indeed of the world. Sustainable ecology is possible when we can successfully combine environmental and socioeconomic dimensions equally in the plans and actions that we pursue. As a matter of fact, it is the extent of their integration and inclusion that truly form a criteria by which we evaluate or value our work and engagements. If there is one thing that I have to state as being the most important learning from our living and working in Mumbai, both for Samarth and me and many, many others, 
friends and colleagues with whom we've been collaborating and working, uh, it is the need for collective intervention. In the current trend of exclusionary urban development with an objective of achieving social and environmental equity and justice for all. As the various conflicts begin to dominate the city landscape, both in terms of the polarization of people and the, and the, and the near destruction of the natural areas, we are compelled to intervene, particularly, and this is very important, in the excluded, discriminated, and much abused backyards of people and places that are, in most instances, situated in the borders, edges, peripheries, and margins of our cities and towns. As an example, picking up an example from Mumbai, it is the over 300 kilometers of water courses that we refer to as nallas or drains of Mumbai and their immediate precincts to which we have turned our backs to. Neither have we have we recognized and considered this vast extent of 150 square kilometers of the natural areas being one third of the city area, been given due recognition or even considered in the planning and development programs of the city. Also as a necessary condition, I consider, and this is very, very important uh, from my learnings here, is that each individual intervention would have to be linked to other democratic rights struggles, thereby building networks of interventions towards evolving an alternate vision of the city. And this is really one of the key objectives uh, that come about through our struggle. And for an understanding of this collective interventions and ecological scrutiny, we will get on to discuss one significant citizen struggle, which we refer to as the Irla Nala movement, as an example. While this example is specific to Mumbai, and it's one of its neighborhoods in Mumbai, the issues it raises will hopefully resonate in the experiences that you have in your respective places of familiarity or work and engagement. The overarching ideas, however, and the principles would hopefully be the same, thus invoking a dialogue and solidarity amongst us. But before we get on to the Irla example, I would like to present a network of movements which has been continuing for over 22, 23, or 24 years that provide a historical perspective to the Irla movement and its position in the larger context of the city. As I said earlier, relating these individual experiences to the larger context, uh, both nationally and globally, is critical. This example of the Irla movement also illustrates its replicability and scalability potential, both of which are very, very important in, in all the individual efforts that we are pursuing uh, with. Now, here's a, a slide that you see on your screen, uh, which sort of very briefly lists uh, the various public um, interest works that uh, my office, uh, including both Samarth and I have been engaged in. And this has moved from many individual projects to larger neighborhood ideas and then to the city. These various projects that I'm talking about or referring to are born out of citizens' movements in which we have participated actively, being limited to public housing, open spaces, and the environment in particular. It is this constant and deliberate erosion of the public spaces, the denial of access to housing by the vast numbers of people and the rampant destruction of the natural areas. All of these three things that I'm talking about, the, the denial of access to housing to the vast numbers of people, 
the rampant destruction of the natural areas and the environment, and the erosion of public spaces have compelled us to engage with these issues. Here's a slide where you see how this kind of progression or relationship of the projects. I mean, I, I, I hesitate to call them as projects. I refer to them as movements truly. And how local movements or small area movements have led to neighborhood movements where you have the projects leading to a vision plan for the neighborhood of Juhu in which the Irla Nala is located. And then how we moved to re-envisioning Mumbai through a open Mumbai plan as we call it that was put up, uh, that was prepared several years back, which was true, which was really a kind of a culmination of various individual works that we uh, pursued uh, over the years. Now the Irla Nala reinvigoration project is what Samarth will now dwell upon uh, and explain its uh, details, uh, including some of the key objectives and achievements of this project. Samarth, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, just very quickly, very excited to be here. Um, I'll jump right in. Uh, you know, the slide that we discussed just before this, where we kind of highlighted the overall timeline um, of and the evolution that this movement has taken over the last uh, two decades, uh, and sort of my, in, uh, you know, meeting that movement at certain point of time uh, was in my architecture school in my undergraduate program uh, here in Mumbai, uh, where the uh, Vision Juhu plan was in fact uh, kind of developed jointly with uh, the design cell of the school where I was uh, uh, where I was studying. Um, and that was when I first kind of, uh, you know, interacted with this uh, larger idea, which has since uh, driven me really uh, in a very, very uh, strong way uh, to looking at these issues uh, sort of critically. And of course, uh, learning from my father, uh, kind of taking uh, a lot of inspiration from him to continue engaging in a very, very active way uh, towards contributing towards some of these issues that we are grap uh, grappling with. Uh, so sort of moving, uh, you know, taking this idea of the movement and how do we break it down into these uh, kind of tangible, uh, I would say, smaller elements uh, that then contribute towards the overall understanding of the larger city plan. So for a minute, I, I'm going to jump into uh, the Vision Juhu plan, which is really re-envisioning public spaces. As uh, was explained, uh, Juhu is a suburb uh, uh, in, in the northern part of Mumbai. Um, and, you know, Vision Juhu Expanding Public Spaces was a kind of document that was put together jointly by our office and the design cell of, uh, of my school, Kamla Raheja uh, Institute of Architecture in Mumbai. Um, and, you know, the document overarching vision, uh, the vision of the document, I would say, is that it aims to protect the natural environment and the best features of the built environment increase commercial viability, encourage tourist and leisure facilities, protect and support communities, create social inclusion, provide people with a voice in landscapes of rapid change and design urban spaces and spaces for people, not necessarily uh, just open spaces. Um, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, planning should most definitely be from the bottom up. The vision Juhu, plan was conceived with the hope of connecting natural assets with institutions as well as residential areas to a rich network of open spaces that then facilitate uh, pedestrian movement through these neighborhoods. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, you know, the Idla Nala kind of just traverses all the way from the north uh, through a total length of almost about eight kilometers and it sort of winds its way through several neighborhoods of our city. Uh, this is the neighborhood of Juhu uh, and very intensely and very closely interacts with a lot of cultural, uh, social, educational institutes that have been set up uh, within the area. Um, and a lot of na other natural assets also of parks, gardens, and we have one of the most famous beaches of Mumbai, which is the Juhu Beach on the western edge. And, you know, this plan uh, in its inception itself was based on the ideas of collaboration and participation by virtue of it being a collaboration with the school as well as the citizens in the area. 
and takes those ideas forward in implementation with active support of the citizens of the neighborhood. So, you know, this is uh, one of the campaign posters that was developed uh, in the propagation of the idea of the Juhu Vision Plan. Um, and, you know, meetings were held in public spaces with this poster. Uh, Juhu Giri, Piyarse, I mean, Juhu Giri is sort of taken from a colloquial slang uh, here in India, which is Dada Giri, which means, uh, you know, by coercive force, you have goons and, uh, you know, don uh, people who, uh, you know, force uh, certain things on other people. But here it's reinterpreted as the collective power of the people of Juhu. And Piyarse, of course, in Hindi means with love. So, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like a good play on those words there, but really illustrating in very, very simple uh, terms to people what the larger issue is and how we can achieve some of these larger goals. I mean, the overall objectives of the plan was to free open spaces, you know, uh, uh, create tree-lined avenues and walkways along these water bodies, interconnect these open spaces to the existing cultural and education institutions, uh, improve access, uh, promote access, and by virtue of promoting access, you also improve the overall uh, vigilance of these kinds of natural areas and open spaces, uh, which then are a, a kind of defense mechanism against uh, sort of encroachments and other activities that are probably not uh, in the interest of uh, you know, the community. And of course, citizens we've mentioned several times uh, play a very vital role in building places. Uh, us as designers, architects, planners, you know, we are in many ways facilitators to enable uh, the success of a plan. A plan is not just a drawing, but a plan is uh, something that a vision, uh, you know, that, that people can relate to and then put their own energies behind making that vision a reality. And so uh, really the idea of, of citizens interaction and community really uh, contributing in a positive way cannot be understated at all. Um, and, you know, the Vision Juhu movement has been rooted in this public participation and democratic plan planning ideals. Uh, you know, the group of citizens in uh, this neighborhood of Juhu have been very, very active in taking, you know, very uh, critical and strong stands against encroachments, against corruptions, against uh, grabbing of open spaces and natural assets. Uh, fighting cases in court, uh, you know, uh, devoting enormous amount of uh, time from their own lives, uh, you know, towards these causes. And really the success of this project is uh, rooted in this kind of uh, energy and participation. And really the people have, uh, you know, grown to feel so strongly about this project that uh, we're sure the uh, kind of ownership of this project will go on for many, many years to come. <clears throat> And so with that as a segue, we'll just kind of go into uh, the idea of the Irla Nala project itself, which is the Irla Nala reinvigoration movement. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, it is a part of the larger Vision Juhu plan. And really as a tangible example of seeing how we can turn some of these neglected backyards into proud cultural forecourts. So in, uh, you know, just to give a large macro context uh, to this project. Uh, we're really looking at the Mon Mumbai metropolitan region. And uh, Mumbai city in many ways is an estuary of sorts. It's uh, surrounded by water on three sides. It has a rich plethora of natural assets, rivers, creeks, nullas, which are these water courses, mangroves, wetlands, salt pan lands, lakes, hills, and even forests. And owing to the natural geography of the city, and also the fact that it has been uh, developed over many, many years, essentially through landfilling moves, because originally Mumbai used to be, uh, you know, several sets of islands. Uh, there are many of these inlets of water or outlets of water that intrinsically interact with the geography of the city. And, you know, these really take the form of the rivers, creeks and nallas. You know, the coastline is dotted with several uh, inlets and outlets of these water bodies. And the Irla Nala is one of those uh, inlets of, uh, of those several water courses that we see in the city. Unfortunately, over the years, as uh, you know, the same fate that uh, 
uh, many, many, many natural assets have met with in our city. Uh, these water courses have been abused. They've become waste and sewage carrying, open sewage carrying drains, which take out effluents uh, to the sea, which they were never meant to do. Uh, the city government, as mentioned earlier, has channelized these water channels with concrete retaining walls on both sides. And that's uh, sort of further severed the ecological environmental attributes of this water course, and therefore also physically has separated them from the people. Now, the larger idea of this project uh, is when we look at the water courses map of Mumbai here on the right, um, you know, can we imagine a scenario where Mumbai, uh, you know, we have 300 kilometers of these water courses uh, throughout the city. And uh, can we imagine a scenario where Mumbaikers have easy access to almost 600 kilometers of landscaped walking and cycling tracks and open spaces along these water courses on either side that intermingle and interweave through various parts of the city's fabric. And this is really the overarching vision that has manifested itself in the tangible project that is the Edla Nala project. Um, you know, Edla Nala runs through the western suburb of Juhu. We've been through this and this map kind of just kind of, uh, shows the various uh, natural assets and institutions that uh, are in the same precinct as this uh, incredible water body. And uh, the proposal looks to interconnect these uh, amenities and open spaces. So that's just a sort of uh, aerial overview of uh, the water body, uh, the water course running through the neighborhood. And this is a sort of very uh, highly unutilized uh, airport, a small little airport, you might call it like, uh, uh, you know, it's a secondary sort of flying school airport, but it has a, a vast uh, natural water body and sort of uh, lake which we look to integrate into this project. Um, and then really our, our focus always has been to try and uh, implement a, a so-called pilot project for any of these various uh, you know, issues that we have discussed in the first uh, opening minutes of the talk. Um, and it's always uh, sort of prudent to demonstrate success at a sort of smaller scale and really demonstrate the ability of that project to be scaled up and multiplied and applied to various other parts of the city. Uh, and so the phase one of this project dealt with only about one and a half kilometers of the seven and a half kilometers of the, of the water body. Um, and you know, as we can see, this is uh, the number of institutions that are along that water course. Um, and then a sort of linear chain of parks also along that water body. That's an aerial overview of this water course, uh, you know, right through running through the neighborhood of Juhu. And the proposal really looks at, as we said, developing this water body as a, as a linear open space with access to walking, cycling and landscaping for the community. So uh, we have here a kind of a video uh, that just very quickly explains the process of cleaning the water. Of course, these are uh, highly neglected and abused water bodies. So there was a big process to in fact clean this water body and bring it to uh, the current state uh, that it is in. Uh, the walls of course were inherited, unfortunately, by uh, <laughs> built by the city officials. But we've really worked with experts uh, in India with the Indian Institute of Technology, which is one of the foremost institutions of the country to devise ways of actually filtering the water and cleaning the water over time. Uh, of course, collecting solid waste, floating material in order to get that sort of physical filth out of the way, getting a lot of silt and sediment that has been trapped uh, or rather has been layered over many, many decades uh, on the beds of these water courses, uh, getting that out and then treating the flowing water through various natural processes of combined treatment units, uh, you know, integrating uh, sort of algae, weeds and plants that help clean the water. And then, of course, develop the adjacent spaces into these uh, walking, cycling areas, uh, integrate community activity by way of uh, incorporating wall art that students can come in and do, uh, promote pedestrianization, cycling uh, within these areas, and really look at you know, these over, uh, overall ideas and how we can look at then scaling this up uh, across longer stretches of this water body is something that we're really interested in doing. 
Um, and as you can see, I spoke about the idea of scalability and how it can be phased up to the entire seven kilometers of that water body. <clears throat> Uh, so you, we can see very quickly some of the images of how the condition was before we uh, really started this project. And the images below really tell the story of how, uh, how this, these spaces have really transformed uh, over, 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 the, over many years, almost about uh, eight or 10 years now that we've been working on this project. Um, and these kind of visuals really uh, stress on that uh, excitement and really that sort of success story of citizens uh, you know, charting the way and leading the way for these kinds of initiatives within their own neighborhoods um, and really transforming these backyards in, in uh, tremendous ways. Uh, another great uh, sort of result of this project has been the fact that we've been able to develop a chain of public parks along the Nala, which, uh, you know, as seen in this image, start forming a sort of immaculate city forest within a very dense urban and sort of built uh, setting. You know, these are very, very important in uh, today's time with uh, rising air pollution, deteriorating air quality. How do we ensure that we create uh, livable spaces for uh, people within our cities? And so uh, almost three or four parks have been developed. Uh, we've worked closely with citizens to develop these plans. Uh, people have contributed to the overall plan itself, even in terms of design, um, you know, everyone from older people to really young kids coming in and uh, demanding what they want uh, in parks and how we can do that. Uh, we've developed one of the largest open air amphitheaters anywhere in the city. Uh, it's already been host to some uh, tremendous cultural events and really seamlessly integrates itself with this uh, park system as well and you know, populates and depopulates as and when uh, required. And really, so you know, what we wanted to kind of end this particular uh, bit uh, is by saying that in its initiatives such as the Irlanala project amongst many others, address these larger issues of city planning and people's active participation in key decisions concerning their daily quality of life, along with the protection, restoration, and improvement of the natural assets that keep the, important, uh, keep the important ecological balance of our cities intact so we can move forward in a more responsible and sustainable mode of development. Such movements are not to be seen merely as a beautification program, but as a part of a larger democratic struggle for reclaiming public space and to create spaces where people meet, share experiences, and begin to care about each other and garner social relationships collectively between them and nature. It is such relationships that cannot be separated from one another and considered exclusive. Rather, together, they form the urban ecosystem. The two together are inextricably both human and biophysical. These are the words by Pickett, Cadenasso, and McGrath. Um, with the NALA and the public spaces being the main planning criteria, we hope to bring about over a period of, a period of time, social change, promoting collective culture and rooting out alienation and false sense of individual gratification that are popularly and generally promoted by the market these days. Unjust social systems are inherently unsustainable. The linear parks created along these NALAs will create more livable neighborhoods for more people in an equitable, equitable way. This equitable expression of nature-based solutions is indeed sustainable. The argument is that we don't get into our cars or into uh, our trains or public transport to travel hours to get to the idea of a central park of the city. How can we create decentralized linear open spaces that very well integrate themselves within the urban fabric so that people within a five or 10 minute walk have access to these spaces that can positively impact their quality of life on a daily basis. So such an approach facilitates people's, uh, local people's active participation. And as I said, they know what's best for them in many ways and their contributions influence city planning and thereby development decisions. You know, with this, I'll just hand it back to uh, 
that for the next aspect that we'd be looking at as part of this talk. Yeah, th thank you, Samarth. Um, I think the next uh, point that we already touched upon is the larger idea of the city and how we can evolve a plan for transformative citywide change. Um, as I call it, uh, what's very important is to demonstrate change uh, through architectural and planning endeavors. Uh, that reinstates confidence uh, in the place amongst the people. Uh, it helps social networking. Uh, it helps people coming together to influence uh, their governments and decisions that are going to be ultimately affecting their lives. Um, with that as an objective, as I mentioned earlier, we put together uh, an exhibition after close to 20, 25 years of working uh, on issues of public spaces uh, and the environment, uh, which was then called the Open Mumbai Plan. Uh, it was an Open Mumbai exhibition. Uh, this exhibition was uh, kept open for nearly about uh, two months in a significant um, gallery. <clears throat> uh, in, in the center of Mumbai. And that was visited by not just people, uh, it was open to all. It was very interestingly, um, uh, you know, um, visited by the uh, head of the state, all the elected representatives uh, from even different areas and districts. And it sort of opened up, uh, it sort of allowed people for the first time to see Mumbai with, through a different lens. I mean, we see Mumbai as we experience it every day, traveling in our cars or in our buses or in trains to the, you know, reaching our workplace from home and getting back uh, at the most on weekends, we interact in our neighborhood markets and bazaars or we go to shopping malls, et cetera. But here was an experience very, very different. It's sort of exposed to the people, the kind of assets that we have, the rich, and the vast extent of the natural assets that the city has. And as I mentioned earlier, nearly one third, over one third area of the city has this vast extent of natural areas compromising of, compromising, uh, including the canals, uh, the, the, the water courses, the lakes, the rivers, uh, the coastline, the forests, uh, the mangroves, the creeks, the wetlands, and so on and so forth. So with all of that, we put together this idea of re-envisioning Mumbai uh, through the idea of open spaces. Uh, and in order to expand the idea of open spaces, we said that the open spaces do include the natural areas and that people begin to then perceive experience and participate uh, on, in their you know, daily lives in the city uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, contribution that these natural areas uh, make to their quality of living in the city. Um, so what we did was we really mapped for the first time the open spaces and the natural areas of the city, which was referred to as the uh, open spaces map. Uh, and that really became a point of reference even during the preparation of the development plan for the city by the municipal corporation and the government. Um, and that's the first time that we really brought out formally that the city's natural areas and the open spaces constitute nearly over one third of the city area. And all the policies of development plans, et cetera, is all focused to that other one th uh, two third. And it just sort of excludes this, uh, you know, this one third important area. The, plan basically proposed a city-wide network of connected public spaces uh, that included the natural areas and the biosystems. Uh, th that was the overarching vision to re-envision the city that has manifested itself in the tangible pilot project that Samarth talked about, the Irla Nala reinvigoration project. Another objective of such movements ought to be the conservation uh, of the vital natural assets of, and their integration with the neighborhoods and the city. Uh, expanding public spaces, both in physical and democratic terms, expanding tree cover, popularizing and demystifying. And this is very important. 
popularizing and demystifying the planning process for effective participation and promoting the idea of neighborhood-based planning. Uh, this is something that we clearly experience through our movements that we don't bring in these big you know, master plans as they are referred to by drawn up by some master who is very clearly far out uh, and distanced from the people and the places and, and the conditions that exist uh, and are demanded uh, by the people who live. Uh, and those plans have then thrusted upon the people by the government and the municipal corporation. But here we talked of this idea that these micro plans born out of people's movements could then add up to the idea of the city. And that really was one of the big things that we sort of learned and pursued. And that struggle, as I mentioned right at the outset, uh, continues and shall continue and will continue <laughs> forever uh, because it really deals with uh, equity and quality of life uh, of all the citizens. Um, integration of the natural areas and unification of people and nature is a law is of utmost priority. But what's interesting here is that through these movements and the projects, we realized it's not just a physical exercise of uh, mapping and interconnecting uh, these various uh, assets of the city uh, and building up a public domain, but really it sort of encourages social networking in the process. People begin to intermingle with each other through these spaces that they, be, that they experience. Uh, and Samarth will, of course, detail out uh, some of these uh, neighborhood-based city planning ideas uh, that have manifested in many other projects of uh, waterfronts restoration. Um, but what's very important about this idea of neighborhood-based development approach is the possibility of decentralizing and localizing projects, thus breaking away from the monolithic planning and design ideas that are disconnected from most people, as I explained. With localized projects, the planning of cities will hopefully become a bottom-up process with participation of all the people. Importantly, neighborhood scale work is more a collaborative approach to the city and place making. For citizens, such projects allow the immediate reclamation, redesign and reprogramming of public spaces within their localities. Now, what's been very interesting, uh, which I will mention in a line really, we don't have time to dwell upon that, is that all these projects that we are showing you that we have participated in uh, and have engaged ourselves with these local area struggles have been funded through eminent uh, uh, members of parliament uh, through their MPLAD fund, a fund provision that the government gives to these elected uh, members of parliament to spend in their constituency. And so for the Ilanala, for example, we had an eminence very eminent uh, writer, lyricist, uh, Javed Akhtar and Bandra and other neighborhoods whose projects uh, Samad will very quickly show you uh, were funded by uh, under the MPLAD scheme by another eminent uh, Bollywood star actor and social activist Shabana Azmi. And that was followed then by many other members of parliament who came out to support. And interestingly, all these projects that have been funded by public funding to which we have our rights and access to, were also implemented by government agencies. And the accounts and the transparency was such that everybody in the area could access to know the accounts and the funding and the expenditures and all of that. So there were, that, that was really some of these lessons that came through the neighborhoods based city planning. Samarth, could you quickly sort of go through some of these other area movements uh, that sort of really uh, strengthens our ideas that we're talking about. Right. Um, so yeah, it just brings us back to the idea of questioning uh, our natural resources and the unutilized potential that they have in terms of contributing to daily life. With over 150 kilometers of coastline, Mumbai is definitely a city on the sea. Uh, yet, how much of this coastline is respected, preserved, and used as planned public space? 
we have the entire eastern edge of the city primarily uh, for sort of dock related and uh, navy related activities uh, so very highly regu regulated and very little access to the eastern waterfront of the city but the western waterfront is almost about uh, you know 60 kilometers in length and is completely adjacent to a lot of residential neighborhoods of the city um, and you know unfortunately only about i would say even put together uh, only about 10 to 15 kilometers of this coastline is currently uh, been thought of and uh, has been opened uh, and made accessible to people so our struggle continues but maybe through some of these examples of uh, neighborhood projects that i will show you now uh, there is a way there is a hope there is a future for how we can make uh, some of this change uh, happen so the promenade of bandra bandstand which is again a western suburb in the city of mumbai and carter road uh, demonstrate how neighborhood initiatives inclusive non-elitist planning and government and private support can transform our seafronts meaningfully. So in the foreground here is in fact a very early image of once the Bandra Bandstand Promenade was um, <laughs> uh, you know, designed and executed. Uh, a very quick overview of the project. The, uh, you know, the, the promenade uh, emerged out of a long battle and struggle that the, that the local, local citizens waged on ground. As you can see the before image, these waterfronts were completely abused, open to uh, discriminate, uh, you know, indiscriminate dumping, uh, illegal activities and complete neglect from the authorities. Um, and in fact, the citizens uh, fought to reclaim this open space, fought against the authorities and police who tried to, uh, you know, put a stop to that kind of activity where people were trying to reclaim their open space, mm -hmm. uh, built a very strong movement uh, as Dad mentioned, also we've uh, had the fortune of, uh, you know, working with very uh, closely with very very, uh, in, uh, you know, incredible people uh, such as, uh, you know, these members of parliament who have come forth and pledged their MP lad funds to the project. But their interaction and in, uh, you know uh, involvement did not end uh, just at sort of pledging those funds and making those funds available for the people. Uh, they were there on the ground they were fighting uh, you know on, on behalf of the people with authorities ensuring work was happening so as he had mentioned in the case of Irla Nala we had uh, Mr. Javed Akhtar who's a prominent writer who even six years after his so uh, so-called term or four years after his term of being a member of parliament has elapsed continues to be as uh, you know intensely involved with the project here in Bandra Bandstand, uh, famous actor Shabana Azmi was involved with the citizens' groups. Uh, you can see her in one of those images in the in the uh, sort of orange sari, and sort of really making uh, some of these projects possible. Uh, and you know, uh, these plans were also drawn up in complete uh, synchronization and discussion with the some citizens. Some of the slides of the have to come on. The slides have to yes. come. On. Yes. 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 Um, so, yes, yeah. yeah. and, um, you know, very important, I just wanted to stress on the fact that if you see the top right image, uh, even in terms of design and architecture, really the promenade, the formal promenade takes a back seat and really uh, celebrates the natural assets that we have of this city. As designers, we tend to Can we interrupt you for a second. Summer? Yes, yes. I can not see the screen that you're sharing. Uh, is everyone else able to see the screen? Yeah, we can see the screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so I'm on the Bandra Bandstand Promenade page. Um, but uh, yes, so similarly, another promenade, uh, which is uh, slightly further uh, north from Bandra Bandstand was the Carter Road Promenade. Both these promenades sort of came into being around about the same time uh, in the early 2000s. So it's almost been 20 years now since these promenades have been developed and continue to be maintained by the citizens of this area. Uh, you know, what also was born out of the citizen struggle was the active uh, vigilance and 
uh, you know, sort of protection group of sorts of citizens where even the authorities in today, uh, whether, whether it's the local authorities of the city, have to get permission from the citizens if they need to carry out any activities on these promenades. So it really sort of changed the way public spaces are maintained in the city. And just another quick video showing the context of these projects. Um, you know, pre-development conditions, a uh, lot of this uh, sort of neglect and abuse. Uh, and, you know, these, uh, this movement also gave rise to a new governance model that emerged uh, out of this process. You know, typically the corporation and private companies were hand in hand and they would kind of force their decisions or impose their decisions uh, regarding public spaces on the citizens. But here uh, developed a new model of governance, a participatory model uh, where the citizens were on the top of the pyramid and then sort of uh, divulged uh, responsibilities to the government uh, and the private companies. And really reclaiming these uh, waterfronts, the movement started back in 99. Um, and, you know, restoration and enhancement of the natural mangrove edge was a very, very important aspect of this project. Uh, from our experiences, uh, world over, we know about storm surges and effects of flooding, but how can we through subtle moves of promenades and uh, you know uh, projects ensure that mangroves uh, you know are brought back they thrive and they also give right to another layer of kind of protection and mitigation against these storm surge events uh, so just kind of uh, very quickly showing what the elements of the project were uh, this is a kind of just a stop motion uh, graphic that we've developed that shows how the promenade has in fact helped the regeneration of the mangroves and the restoration of the natural coastline uh, that used to exist along the uh, along the city's edge. Uh, you know, interestingly, in Bandra Bandstand, uh, and this is a little bit kind of dealing from uh, taking from my uh, experience in New York post Sandy when I had, the, uh, of course, the pleasure of working with Kate in her studio, and really looking at the idea of ensuring a connect with the waters. Uh, you know, the people. A need to have that connection with the water and how can we look at the idea of stepped retaining walls rather than these big walls that governments put up uh, to ensure a new relationship with water that then emerges uh, and this is a kind of uh, the latest renovation if you uh, were to call it uh, in uh, sort of 2016 that the promenade's edge uh, was sort of redesigned and uh, re-envisioned as a stepped edge towards the water uh, that allows that kind of interaction <clears throat> Another project very quickly in Bandra, uh, this is the Land's End Amphitheater, if you can see the images on top, a uh, kind of a beautiful hillside with uh, an iconic Bandra fort uh, right at the water's edge, which was uh, being encroached upon by the neighboring hotel and being uh, captured and you know used for real estate development. Citizens fought back, reclaimed this space and what emerged was a beautiful cultural center, the only amphitheater or cultural performance space by the water in a city on the water, which is kind of ironic. Uh, but also this project was a kind of dual project, which obviously created this beautiful institution and cultural setup, but also ensured the restoration and protection of the hill slope along with the fort uh, that uh, exists over there. A major project was the iconic Juhu Beach, which I mentioned, uh, one of the most largely visited public spaces in, in the city. Uh, and, you know, this image that you can see in before, the entire central beach was in fact occupied by these stalls and food vendors. And after a long battle in court over many, many years, uh, as you can see, the central beach was kind of cleared of these encroachments, but these stalls and food owners were not evicted, they were not thrown out. In fact, they were replanned towards one side of the prom, uh, of the beach, as you can see in a formal food court. Uh, so there's a kind of symbiotic relationship that developed here where the city benefited, the people did not lose their livelihoods, their means of kind of, uh, uh, you know, making, making money. Um, and also what has emerged is this incredible public space that was always there, just kind of uh, somehow over the years uh, managed to had managed to kind of disappear from people's sight and our master plan also addressed the access points to the beach across four kilometers of length of the beach uh, looked at integration of this natural asset with the uh, with the community also covered a spectrum of activities uh, both on and off the beach 
in its immediate surroundings. Also, the, some of the fa salient features included proposals to reduce traffic congestion, <coughs> generate new parking spaces, pedestrian crossings, and clearing the central beach of encroachments. The Gateway of India precinct, which is a very <coughs> iconic, iconic uh, monument, uh, the Gateway of India, uh, you know, it's located in South Mumbai. Sadly, this plaza was a clutter of disparate structures and unplanned activities with no cohesive design holding them together. So you can see the image on the bottom where yeah. sort of, uh, yeah, so the, this large garden, which was just sort of unutilized and how this project really opened up uh, the entire space uh, for, the, for the monument. And several other projects that we've engaged with uh, across uh, across the city, dealing with these natural assets of uh, wetlands and mud flats, and how we can very sensitively intervene in these spaces. <clears throat> Through the movement, of course, there have been several publications that uh, we have developed and published uh, that support this movement, um, and these are all available. Uh, also, uh, if anyone needs to access them on our website. Um, but yeah, these are always, always byproducts of, of the movement. Yeah, so uh, back to you. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Samarth. Um, what's been very interesting for us in this journey um, of struggles is uh, the learning that urban planning and design provides incredible power for the achievement of the objective of unification of people and nature. It is for this reason that we've been arguing that participation in urban planning and design need to be considered a right and that its popularization and democratization of the same is indeed important. Uh, planning and architecture are an effective democratic tool of social change an instrument for mobilizing collective movements. Cities are not spaces for competition nor for individual and disparate efforts. To us, they are a fantastic opportunity for forging collective and cooperative effort. Larger public participation and engagement of people's organizations in the development of development process truly help develop a city and planning and architecture should integrate with it for enabling social changes and achieving development justice. In conclusion, I would like to sort of very quickly, though we've exceeded our time, uh, but I'll just take five more minutes. Um, it is necessary to re-envision cities in order to elevate the quality of life and environment that we are subject to. Networking of people in places that includes the natural areas is an effective democratic means for the achievement of this objective. But for long, our discourses on cities have relied on the understanding of social relationships and how the modes of production have influenced the, this formation. To support this statement, I would like to refer to David Harvey when he quotes from Karl Marx in his book, Social Justice and the City. The totality of these relationship of, these relationship of production constitutes the economic structure of society, the real foundation on which arises a legal and political superstructure and to which correspond definite forms of social consciousness. The mode of production of material life conditions the general process of social, political, and intellectual life. I continue with the quote, in terms of Marxist terminology, the urban and the process of urbanization are simple superstructures of the mode of production. Further in the same book, Harvey has analyzed social relations built form and environment, and how each influences the other, but his reference to environment is restricted to built environment and does not include the natural ecosystems. And I quote from Harvey, urbanism may be regarded as a particular form of patterning of social process. This process unfolds in a specially structured environment created by man. The city can, therefore be regarded as a tangible built environment, an environment which is a social product. But interestingly, on the other hand, Piquet, Candeso and McGrath in their book, Resilience in Ecology and Urban Design, and I'm quoting from them, 
uh, present a wider understanding of the environment. And this is what uh, really we are interested in. I quote, a great deal of urban sustainability literature tends to promote the so-called brown agenda of environmentalism, which emphasizes the need to solve immediate needs of the billions of people who live in degraded, unsanitary conditions and grueling poverty. While the green agenda, on the other hand, emphasizes protection and enhancement of ecosystems to support future generations and other species. Reconceal, reconciling, reconciling green with the brown agenda issues, however, is at the heart of more encompassing viewpoints on sustainability. Recognizing that poverty and environment conservation are inextricably entwined. I end with the quote from his book. Through initiatives like the Irlanala project, and the reclaiming of the waterfronts and public spaces movements, we aim to bring these natural areas in Mumbai to the forefront to protect them, facilitate the right of way of these streams to function efficiently, in, including ensuring space for their swell, will allow citizens to understand the role they play in the larger ecological system of the city. These nature-based solutions in the form of a restored ecosystems are inherently sustainable, much than the gray solutions currently in place, like the concretization that I talked about. The struggle for unification of the broken pieces of urban ecology is a political battle, ultimately, that must be pursued through democratic rights struggle. I believe, and I quote from Amartya Sen and Drez, Public action can play a central role in economic development in bringing social opportunities within the reach of people. What the government ends up doing can be deeply influenced by the pressures that are put up on the governments by the public. At this point, I would also like to quote another very favorite author and writer, Henry Leferber, uh, an urban, uh, and really an urban thinker, a radical urban thinker, in his book, Urban Revolution, and I quote, separation and segregation break the relationship between people and nature. They constitute a totalitarian order whose strategic goal is to break down concrete totality, to break the urban. Segregation complicates and destroys complexity, which is a necessary sustainable criteria. I end with his quote, but this is very interesting that Leferber does. He, for the first time, really discusses urban and what is urban. And I'll not now get into the details of that, but that's a point that I'll leave it for you all to dwell upon uh, and read uh, on the subject, because we very sort of loosely talk about urbanization and urban, where most of our cities are actually experiencing uh, an opposite process of, um, of segregation, uh, deprivation, and underdevelopment um, through the idea of city building. Um, at a political level, and I conclude with this few lines, our, stri our, our struggles over the years against the rapidly expanding phenomena of segregation, as I said in the beginning of people and places and of natural areas, uh, segregation, exclusivity, and discrimination against the abuse, misuse, and colonization of public resources and exclusionary city planning. Our fight is for networking and integration, for equality, environmental justice, and the democratization of ecology, indeed of our cities. Thank you. I'll end with these words. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, David, and thank you, Carl. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> some great, um, what I'm really happy with is to see both very specific uh, kinds of intervention and also to, to kind of uh, frame it with respect to um, 
your larger social political concerns. Uh, and uh, that's a, that's really important for us uh, in, in our teaching to keep the students um, thinking in theoretical political terms as well as um, thinking in detail and material terms. And um, that is uh, what we see here. Um, <clears throat> I am going to go. So we have uh, a bunch of questions that are coming in like wildfire right now. Hold on just one sec while I collect. And, and organize my thoughts. <clears throat> We're going to start actually um, with uh, a question from Ria, who um, I think we introduced you to earlier, who you don't really need introducing to. So uh, Ria, can you um, show us yourself and unmute yourself and everyone can, um, turn on their, their cameras if they'd like, um, and, and we can have a kind of Zoom person uh, relationship for a few minutes. <clears throat> so um, Ria is a new student in the urban design program uh, at Columbia and uh, also uh, worked with uh, PK Das and Associates. And uh, we think she'd be a good start to asking some questions and then um, we'll see what happens. Take it away, Ria. Hi, so hi, Samad. It's, it's great to um, you know, meet you here again. It's, it's been, it was great to see all the work that you guys um, you know, showed again. Thank you for such an insightful uh, presentation. Um, I think my question stems from uh, you know, about part participation, you know, having worked on projects um, and I understand the importance. So I think, um, you know, large scale projects um, like citywide network, like you mentioned about public spaces, require um, a support of um, a lot of stakeholders like government. Um, so I think my question is, what were the challenges or the hurdles that came along um, in this participation and for the successful implementation of the vision? And, you know, what should we as designers, um, you know, focus on when we when we engage? Samar, would you like I, to take? Are, no, we, think, are, are, are we taking one question at a time, or would you be summarizing some of these questions? Uh, I will be you... summarizing some questions uh, later as a, on, but as a bunch, or uh, yes, I will. But you can take uh, Ria's now, please. <laughs> Samar, would you like to deal with this question? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, hi, Ria. <laughs> no, I think. Uh, like I said, the movements uh, that I have personally been exposed to by way of uh, the firm's work, as of course, uh, goes back uh, many years, even before I formally started engaging with uh, the city as a designer or an architect. But I think the uh, uh, one of the standout, uh, uh, you know, elements, or I would say, uh, standout aspects of this continuous struggle is the fact that uh, you yourself cannot allow yourself to be broken, uh, cannot allow yourself to be let down by uh, every single system in place, which is specifically designed to break you. Uh, you know, these systems are very carefully orchestrated and, uh, you know, planned by those in power, be it city officials, be it, uh, you know, uh, people, uh, politicians who are in power, who have been elected into power. Uh, and then so-called start sort of you know, misusing their power uh, uh, in many, many different ways. Uh, but I think the main uh, idea here is to, uh, you know, ensure that your resolve uh, sort of supersedes that struggle. Uh, it's very important. Uh, I, I think we've not, uh, said it many times in this talk. We cannot uh, understate the importance of dialogue and reaching out to people. Uh, you know, I, I, I mentioned very briefly that architects and designers and planners are more facilitators than really, uh, you know, holding that sort of big pen over the city and drawing lines on the city. Um, and I think as young designers, it's very important to pay attention to that. Uh, there are, of course, many, many things that um, tempt you in different ways. Uh, there are many streams of 
design and architecture obviously that uh, uh, are available uh, it's almost like a market out there right every every firm every organization every individual is marketing themselves and their approach to the way uh, things are done uh, but i think it's very important to uh, take a step back and really understand what uh, the people have to say and what ideas they have uh, you know very uh, to just sum it up very shortly i think dad had said a few years back even in the inception of the bandra bandstand and the carter road projects uh, even though he was on the ground every day with the people with the member of parliament with the police with the city <laughs> officials i don't think there was ever a time when you know there was a plan a physical master plan drawn in the office and taken out to the people because the, the act of drawing a plan itself is alienating to most people we as designers and planners take time to comprehend and understand what a plan is uh, even though we've been at it for so many years so can you imagine what that does to a kind of ordinary person of the neighborhood so how do you communicate your ideas is is a big big challenge and i think you uh, learn that as you grow uh, uh, you know through participation and through your dialogues and interactions so i think keep at it is uh, is the only word i can say with my kind of limited experience of dealing with these projects well just to add a line to what samat said <clears throat> it's something like a story telling session you know you go to communities you sit with them and you uh, don't really talk about your ideas and plans uh, you sort of discuss an area um, and bring up issues joint you know then there's a dialogue <clears throat> there is a kind of an interaction and then the ownership is collective so at no point we could say that this plan was by pk das and associates it was the residents association who took the ownership but you know but just in a line to sum up this thing about participation is a very complex political uh, phenomena and the word has is much cliched uh, all of us use it uh, most often very loosely uh, i'll give you one example and leave it with that Uh, you know we have many many instances where upper class communities have moved to law courts uh, and the courts have considered their voice and opinion as public opinion and they certainly have been exclusive opinions and those law courts have then favored those opinions and passed judgments uh there is often a discrimination often a screening often a exclusion of many other voices of people of different classes castes gender who somehow are not able to get in to participate by the fact of the kind of walls that we build around in these dialogues and in these participatory processes uh it's a very complex phenomena i can i mean it can form a subject of another long discussion so i'll not get into that but leave it with this point of you to think how truly participation can be all inclusive and democratic uh it requires a lot of patience a lot of perseverance and tenacity and for a professional who's trained in physical planning and design we often very seldom find these qualities there's a huge deficit of these three qualities that i talked about thank you thank you so much thank you um ria i'm going to ask a question and then we'll come back to you for another question um <clears throat> several of the uh, participants in today's uh, lecture um are asking about um conflicts of ownership and uh land rights and um and wealth with respect to um let's say along the 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 uh, waterways um the nulas um and so um when you talk about the um neglected backyards along and then and then you and then there's this proposals we see to renovate them and to and to make them more uh more public um how is that process actually managed because it seems like um 
um, there's a drastic change um, in in the way in which uh, <clears throat> the so-called the neglected backyards are made into sort of public backyards in some way. So I, I'm some some of the students and, and other listeners are seeing a kind of tension there. I wonder if you can clarify that. Well, that's a tough question um, uh, in terms of the time that we have and the scope of our discussion. Uh, but yes, these are very important questions though um, that we have to deal with. Um, well, you know, um, I'll give you just another example of movements that I'm also involved with is the housing rights movements of the slum dwellers uh, and, the, uh, and the working class communities uh, in the city of Mumbai. Often these people in most many parts of the world are evicted from city centers or from prominent areas uh, into the fringes. Uh, and, and these people are then gradually excluded from the so-called development programs uh, just by the fact of their physical uh, displacement. And these displacements are very important for us to understand. In our instance, what we talked about is not just displacement of people, but displacement also of the natural areas and natural conditions, both of which are important to be addressed. Uh, there are these incredible coastlines as we talked about, the natural areas and assets that we talked about like mangroves, considered often as bushes and destroyed uh, by land sharks and our governments equally to create more land for real estate. So one of the things really we are talking about is inclusiveness, uh, is a plan that accommodates all existing realities, not a master plan that clinically separates uh, work and living and industry and housing and com commercial establishments and so on and so forth, but looking at it uh, from a different lens that we are talking about brownfield projects, we're talking about existing cities. Can we recognize and accept that the beginning of a plan is the existing realities and how do we accommodate them in the plan? How do we regenerate? How do we renovate? How do we conserve then displace? then launching mega schemes and mega projects that essentially displaces. I think these are some of these larger questions I'm raising to answer your question and leave them as questions for further discussion subsequently. Uh, I'm at any time uh, hesitant to give a finite conclusive answer uh, for the reason that I experienced that through our physical uh, projects of public spaces uh, renovation or reclamation is that when you do a project very finely detailed, very finely finished, as we architects love to do to the last detail, then we leave no scope for change and innovation through participation by the people. That a space must keep evolving, that a place must keep moving and evolving. And this dynamic process must be recognized by physical planners and architects and consciously dealt with by not dealing with all details, but leaving them for future and further detailing through dialogues and discourses. So often a lot of my, these projects that we talked about um, will seldom be photographed for architectural details or design details. For we have also learned parallelly through our experiences that when such efforts have been made by physical planners, that the place has alienated people from being involved and engaged. It's either wow, so good or so terrible. I mean, even a terrible thing is accepted when it's evolved out of a collective process is my experience. So I think I'll leave this whole question of the neglected, much abused uh, fringe backyards of the city as I keep referring to them, uh, which could also be places right in the heart of the city. I don't mean just physically fringes. I mean, the act of exclusion uh, of people and places is 
does constitute a significant uh, political uh, uh, thinking um, and commitment. Uh, so we must work in these fringes to begin with and not work towards beautification of already well done places. Thank you. Okay, interesting. Okay, uh, Ria, did you want to ask a second question? Ria, we didn't plant you there. <laughs> when you, when no, you no, I did. I did. Columbia <laughs> University. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Um, oh, maybe yeah. I, I did plan it. Maybe I did plan it. <laughs> um, yeah, so in terms of is involved in, in the office, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so in terms of uh, land use, transportation, um, and, you know, hard and soft uh, infrastructure, you know, all of these elements play an important um, complex role in urban design. So um, in recent years, um, what we call existing conditions um, now kind of include uh, global climate um, emergency and, you know, massive uh, public health trauma. So I think uh, my question is, how does that, how does your recent work um, in, introduce these uh, conditions while engaging with um, public or private clients who may have different uh, goals uh, in mind. So how are the existing and you know, um, the conditions vary? I'll answer one part of your question and maybe Samad can deal with the other part of the question. Uh, yes, to, uh, to my mind, uh, one of the biggest uh, enemies, if I may call it, uh, or uh, issues that we have to deal with uh, is colonization of public assets for private benefit or the word privatization through neoliberal globalization that is really daunting us. It's kind of taking away from under our feet our ground. It's kind of pauperizing the state, the people and places uh, of these rich uh, assets that we have as pub in the public domain. Uh, so we have to work, <clears throat> we have to address these issues through our work. We have to not fall prey to big monies coming in to do, if I may use the word, really, you know, what shall I say, um, turned on public spaces with glamour uh, and extravaganza, uh, you know, with and glossy tie uh, finish. Uh, you're breaking up a little bit for us. Um, yeah, your voice is breaking up. Uh, and frugal way. I think some of these things are constantly built into the plans, ideas about redevelopment and inflammation. Um, that's the political uh, question that I wanted to just sort of deal with uh, and answer as part of your question. And the other part, maybe some of can take on. Yeah, but very quickly, I mean, I think most of the points are covered with that response. Uh, but, you know, I did read some of the questions that have come in. Also, there's this idea, uh, Ria, which is sort of piggybacking to your question, which is uh, even in a very so-called participative and democratic uh, public meeting, you generally do tend to have uh, you know, well-known figures or celebrities or personalities who kind of come there and it, some, somehow you start seeing that, uh, uh, you know, they start leading those discussions and diverting them into, uh, into places that they need them to go. Uh, but I think that's, he's already answered it. I think it's important to take a step back. Uh, it's important to not always have that uh, definitive answer uh, to every question that anyone throws. Um, and I think it's, it's as, as designers or planners or architects, I think it's important for us to also navigate through some of that and take time to process it and then maybe choose to respond or not respond at all to some of those things. Uh, so definitely there are multiple agendas, uh, so to speak, uh, that are being driven by various, various different, uh, uh, you know, people uh, and agencies and sort of actors out there. Uh, but I think it's important for us to keep the overall vision 
in mind and really pick uh, very selectively and drive the project in a direction uh, uh, that you that you envision there are certainly roadblocks but i think uh, also navigating and sort of dealing with them is a part of that uh, dialogue process and how we learn to do that is something that we have to develop and consciously uh, keep evolving in in dealing with those situations this is the last part of the answer to you and which is to everybody is uh, which i talked about in the uh, in the presentation is that uh, you know every individual effort must be linked to larger democratic struggles uh, and intersectoral uh, struggles. And that's how we uh, then sort of survive and succeed uh, to the next level of the democratization of our ecology and the cities. Okay. <clears throat> I have a, another question uh, put together from a few that may be uh, slightly more technical, but also um, uh, kind of methodological uh, and material. Um, <clears throat> there's a, some interest uh, in the idea of who owns um, some of the, the properties, whether there's their own publicly, whether they're owned privately or some other arrangement. And secondly, in this idea of created interconnected waterways and an interconnected system that you said was quite long for the for the um, <clears throat> for the uh, the large scale stream uh, the Nula. Um, <clears throat> so how do you deal with things upstream versus downstream since you're not in charge of all of it and and how can you plan around the the, the kind of um, the full scale uh, of the idea of interconnected waterways? Uh, when in fact you are dealing with just pieces of it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a it's it's a very very valid question, a very <laughs> important question. <clears throat> no, we've not succeeded. Let me confess, we've not succeeded uh, from those points of view uh, through our journey uh, till now. Uh, hopefully, it would be an achievement at some point of time when many groups upstream, downstream, midstream, all come together uh, and simultaneously address and uh, join hands. Um, but um, there are therefore these interim problems that we have to deal with. You may call them as compromises, you may call them as weaknesses of the project, but I have always believed that somewhere we need to intervene and demonstrate change. What is important is to be the ability in us as physical planners and designers is to translate a lot of these um, political and social and environmental ideas into tangible projects on the ground. And to be able to demonstrate change through these tangible projects uh, are very, very significant and important to the movement for it further strengthens the movement. Uh, and, and it's been true with many of our projects uh, and movements in Mumbai. I mean, governments wouldn't look at these works when we started, in fact, they opposed them. They wouldn't give us sanctions, but it was by the sheer determination of the local area people that these were implemented and then approved and then recognized by the government. So it's been the opposite process. So if you wait forever for permission, you may not get it, but it's just the strength of the movement that sort of ensures that we implement it. So that form of implementation may not be a complete one. And I talked about the difference between completing a project and not completing, a, not being able to complete a project and how dynamic that process, it reflects the, dynam the dynamics of it. Uh, any, any individual project reflects the dynamics of the larger issue and the larger process. I think these kinds of uh, questions and issues that we keep confronting enriches the struggles. And those are the important lessons, David. Uh, I will not be able to give you a very specific answer. What, of course, was hinted as an answer was through the Open Mumbai exhibition. That Irla Nala, which is just about four to five kilometers long, is not what we are just talking about as a finished product that can be packaged and marketed in the city. 
we brought to notice that Irlanala four kilometers is a part of the 300 kilometers of the water courses, which were originally the water courses of the estuary. And they have to be reinvigorated if we have to prevent floods, if, if we have to check climate change effects, catastrophic impacts, which is no more abstract, which are no more ideas of professionals and scientists and forecasts. These are experiences that people are bitterly experiencing in every city of the world today. Manhattan did that, Mumbai faced that, a flood cyclone, an increasing cycle of floods and cyclones, uh, and that is inevitable. So I think those paths are important, as long as the paths can relate to the larger uh, idea. Just to, uh, um, just to quickly answer to the ownership aspect of you know, these spaces, most often than not, uh, most of these spaces are under the jurisdiction of the city. Uh, and most often they've been ignored and neglected, and most often they've been encroached upon and colonized by those uh, who are in power. I think it's also very important to understand that the city needs to take ownership of its spaces. And through movements like this and through certain tangible projects that we have showcased, I think it keeps the city in check in many ways. It shows and holds them accountable for some of these spaces and ensures that sort of accountability. Um, you know, even the, the product, uh, the very real product of our success emerging from the Open Mumbai exhibition, which was mentioned in the talk, is the fact that the new development plan of the city, which was being drafted, uh, you know, over the last six or seven years, uh, the Open Mumbai exhibition has in a very direct way uh, impacted that development plan in to say that all the natural areas and not just the natural areas, their recognized buffer areas are now formally incorporated within the development plan of the city, which happened for the first time in the history of the city. So till today, there was no line on a map that anyone could use to fight for or argue about its ownership or its uh, land use or its use. But today, because it's on that plan, at least it gives you one, uh, you know, one foot through the door in saying that here is that right that we need to fight for. Um, and it certainly holds uh, those in power responsible. So I think those are the uh, two points I wanted to mention. Um, and to sum up your question. question by an answer is that the governments can't be abdicating their responsibility. We firmly believe that democratically elected governments have a responsibility and they must take that responsibility. And we as participants must put adequate pressures on our governments to take that responsibility through such struggles and movements and not hand it over to a private agency. I think that is also a part, a significant aspect of the struggle uh, and the projects that we talked about. Um, that makes me um, think one more kind of, it's quasi technical, but it's also political as, you, as you're describing it, which is that um, in, the, in, the, in the situation where uh, <clears throat> water and greenery and streets uh, kind of come together, where you draw a line, a political line, an ownership line, or a jurisdiction, just jurisdictional line, uh, becomes extremely important because it 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 requires different participants, uh, different kinds of inputs, and so um, <clears throat> one thing we talk about in our studios is is actually how to blur certain lines between uh, different That's types right. of water, between different types of of inhabitation between different types of movement of water uh, or movement of, of people. So I'm wondering um, how, at the scale you're working on, I cannot possibly imagine how many kind of lines you come across, but I think we're interested um, these days in, in how uh, urban designers can kind of actually blur the given boundaries. Absolutely. Um, as well as recognize, as you put it, PK, that that governments act in certain ways and, and we depend upon them to act in certain ways. 
but the boundaries themselves um, kind of chart their their actions as well. Absolutely, Dick. I, I completely agree with you. We have to make an effort towards Good. blurring these lines. Absolutely. <clears throat> and, and also influence our governments to bring about legislative changes. That's again very important. The, the laws are amended to support some of these ideas that are evolving on the ground. Hi, Geeta, seeing you after a long time. <laughs> um, Rio, do you have one more question? We have time for one, maybe two more. Rio, would you like to ask one or, or are you done? It's, it's Gita also has a couple of questions. I think it's, I think it's, been, I think it's been answered mostly, so yeah. I'm, okay. I, thank you. Uh, Gita, um, I'm all in favor of picking on people and, and Samarth and PK have called you out. <laughs> You're muted. You are muted. Sorry. First of all, I want to thank you for the wonderful, wonderful lecture. So very proud of Samarth particularly. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you, Gita. Thank you. So my big question is that I know, BK, that you have worked in the Ravi. You worked with the slum dwellers, with the you know, people in informal settlements. So my big question was that in all the pictures you showed, people look very well-dressed and rather wealthy, <laughs> if I may say so. So what happened to the slum dwellers and, and uh, sidewalk dwellers in all these areas that were displaced? What was the plan for that? Maybe, maybe the pictures were not rightly selected. Uh, Gita, the experience in Bandra, Bandstand, and Carter Road in particular has been very, very interesting from the point of view of the question that you're raising. Uh, if you know, these are all unbarricaded public spaces. There is no big compound wall with gates and security that restricts or screens people entering these places. So you have these incredible you know, opportunity and space in these promenades where the neighboring fishing villages, villagers, um, men, women, children, get to the promenade and use it as their, their open space, as their neighborhood open space, because they all live in very, very congested uh, villages and uh, neighborhoods. Uh, you have street children up there in these promenades. There are some wonderful pictures we have uh, because Samarth really didn't go through some of those projects in detail, uh, uh, but was touching upon some few ideas that we wanted to dwell upon. Uh, but that's a struggle, Gita. You have a very important question that you've read. The first question that citizens in most areas, most citizens in most areas, uh, raise and are concerned about is how to regulate access. And it's constantly a fight by me and our groups to overcome that, to be able to successfully not have those barricades, but to leave them open. And we've experienced in Bandra, Banston, Carter Road that having left them open, it has not led to any big misuse and degeneration. In fact, it's the other way, that it's, it's helped evolve a better relationship. But that's a big struggle, Gita. The struggle to be able to successfully integrate is a tall order. Not all struggles, including the ones that we illustrated and talked about, have been successful, let me admit, successful entirely, if I may say so. But certainly we have succeeded a step forward. And I think what we need to judge is that step that we've taken forward and how we can move further from there. And there are serious questions of obstacles and hurdles and restrictions that not just city authorities, even classes of people who want to impose on the city. These constant barriers and barricades that do come up, dividing our cities forever. Our cities stand divided, as I said in my talk. How do we dismantle these barriers? That's on the banner slide of our talk dismantling these barriers and networking and integrating people and places is a challenge for all of us. 
I do not have a finite answer at this point of time. And that's precisely the political struggle that I talked about or the democratic struggle that I talked about. And, but for me as a physical planner and designer, these projects through the regeneration and reclamation have been incredible means for that build up to strengthen a democratic process, mm -hmm. to reopen questions that have otherwise been shut, to reopen doors that has been shut on our faces, that there is no dialogue, that there is no storytelling. We will give you what you require, a finished product by appointment of a professional architect planner through a formal tendering process. And what they design with us as governments and decision makers is the final product. These projects have challenged those ideas. I was dwelling upon largely on some of those lessons and processes. Thank you so much, PK. I would just like the listeners to also just know that the areas you're working in, Juhu and Bandra, are amongst the most elite areas in uh, Mumbai. And also the fact that 6%, uh, you know, the 60% of Mumbai's population lives in 6% of the land, right? So uh, those are the slum dwellers and pavement dwellers. So my, uh, you know, the idea is that when such a great project like you showed, uh, can there be a parallel project that people who were living there, they have space to go and housing is then their right to housing, you quoted. Le Favre, uh, you know, um, the right to the city. Where is their right to housing, you for example? Off the point. Because I'm, I'm Gita, afraid the, that you've the, taken the, us to a different the, subject, and I don't think. No, I'm. Let me let me let me just complete my answer to your question. You are partly wrong in your assumption. Mumbai is a very interesting city. Probably the only city I can think of in the world where very rich and the very poor share compound walls and intermingle physically across the length and the breadth of the city. Unlike Delhi, for example, where the poor have been evicted to trans areas. Uh, so that's a factual correction. Even though Bandra and Juhu refer to you as upper, upper class areas, have an equal number or more numbers of poor people living in these areas. So factually, it's wrong. Mumbai is an incredible city from that point of view. And this has happened not because of some enlightened governments here. It's happened because of the long history of the struggles of the poor and the working class and the slum dwellers for their rights, through which a law has been possible that they cannot be evicted unless rehabilitated. In fact, in situ rehabilitation has come to being the reality in a city like Mumbai. Mm -hmm. So that's just a factual correction of what you talked about. On the other hand, yes, I have experience. We have worked on rehabilitation projects. We have addressed questions of shared spaces. I'm not calling them public spaces within redevelopment areas of the poor, settlements of the poor and the working class. Maybe one of the largest rehabilitation projects in Asia at a single site has been executed by Nivara Haq, a slum dwellers housing rights movement of which I'm a member, active member. And as an architect, I've contributed to the movement in the resettlement of that area. And there's been very interesting experiences of what we call are the shared spaces of that and not housing merely as a product of units of houses as it's doled out to the poor everywhere in the world. So I'm not diverting, I would like to stop. Uh, answering your question at this point of time, because that's another debate and we can talk about it. Yeah, yeah, no, no, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's really important that you're working towards somehow an alternative to the city. Yes, it's very mixed, but it is increasingly becoming segregated. So we all have to push against that. And I think urban designers have a big role which you have highlighted today. So thank you very much. And you and I can continue our discussion. Yeah, okay. sure. I just have to say that yes. we don't feel pity for the poor. <laughs> we 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 fight for the rights of the poor. Yeah, yeah. I think that um, that discussion, uh, the kind of effects of urbanization, uh, 
is a global question and yes. um, absolutely the mm -hmm. made worse or made actually catastrophic by climate change and COVID. So in fact, these are uh, old arguments, but given incredibly sad new life uh, in our current situation. As some, I think you mentioned it's, or somebody mentioned it's like 112 in Portland, Oregon today. So uh, <laughs> um, it's, um, now it's a problem because it's happening to, 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 to the United States. No, sorry, I didn't mean to say that, sorry. Well, um, I talked about, <clears throat> I read out a quote from Macred uh, from their book, which really talked about this duality of the, it's not poor versus the environment. Uh, it's the poor with and the environment that have to be addressed together. Yes, and, yes. And it's, it's because climate change is not affecting just the rich or the poor uh, differently. Um, I think this There's is a good lesson. That is, you know, sort of established mm -hmm. uh, through the impact of climate change or the global warming or the sea level yes. rise. Yes. So even I mean, I think, our struggles sorry. for the rights of the poor must address issues of ecology and environment. I think that um, we have to uh, give the students a break before they start their discussions. <laughs> and um, uh, I think it's been a real um, ins insightful lecture covering both the details and the kind of um, <clears throat> umbrellas if you will, that, that take up what we do and what we want students to um, see they're headed into. So um, on behalf of the program, thank you so much. And um, <clears throat> the questions that have been asked will be circulated to our student discussion groups, which are taking place the rest of today. And um, I think it's been a terrific uh, exploration of so many of the key issues urban design and sort of technical material terms, but political and social terms as well. So I just want to thank you, uh, Samarth and PK, and um, hope to thank see you very you much. Zoom with you sooner or later. Thank, thank you so all. Much. Thank you all. All the best to you, Ria. Bye, David. Uh, thank you. David, you mentioned, you mentioned students need to take a break. Did we ever get a break, Geeta? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's a myth. <laughs> The break, the break in the mid. <laughs> it's a new accommodation. Yes. We, have to, we have to allow. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just uh, kidding. All right. Don't worry. We torture Great. them other ways. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you.